in the Underdark, no one can hear you scream. What are you doing? Filming an intro. Hello everybody, Jordan here, the PH is silent, and this episode is brought to you by Dice Dungeons. They make RPG accessories for you, the RPG fan. Metal dice, polymer dice, battle maps, inspiration coins. I'm thinking of getting some red, white, and blue dice uh, this 4th of July for an Independence Day game. Or perhaps you need an alchemist oil set for your artificer. So check them out, Dice Dungeons. They've been great to work with. They've been really supportive of the channel, so go and support them. And if you use the link in the description and use the promo code JORDAN with a PH in the middle, then you'll get 10% off your first order with Dice Dungeons. Thank you again, Dice Dungeons, for sponsoring this video. But now let's talk about Out of the Abyss. I love this adventure, like, so, so much. I think it's just because it's so, like, raw and brutal, and I like uh, characters and stories like that. And I think this might be my favorite adventure that I've read from Wizards of the Coast, but I haven't read all of them. I haven't read uh, Waterdeep or Dungeon of the Mad Mage because I'm hoping to play in those at some point. But um, of all of the other ones that I've read, I think Out of the Abyss is my favorite. Now, if Out of the Abyss had a theme, I think it would be survival. You are lost alone in the Underdark and you have very little provisions with you and it is your job as the player to really survive this encounter. You need to get out of the Underdark and find things like water and food and weapons and armor and things to help you fend off all of the evil creatures that are trying to eat you. There are powerful forces within the Underdark that are causing all kinds of mischief and catastrophe, and it is going to be up to your players to avoid those, get away from them, and then ultimately come back and stop them. Trying to escape the Underdark, hunted by evil drow, um, it's... It's really a difficult scenario to kind of sell to players because you don't really get a feel like heroes right away, but we'll get into that a little later. Um, right now, let's talk about the lore that you should probably know if you want to run out of the abyss. And then after I talk about the lore, we'll kind of talk about my thoughts about the adventure as a whole. Welcome to the world of the Underdark. The Underdark is divided up into three sections, the Upper Dark, the Middle Dark, and the Lower Dark. It is a huge network of caverns, tunnels, and caves that connect. Some are made by creatures in the Underdark, some are natural. It fits for a fantasy world, but I often wonder how many sinkholes appear in Faerun, because the Underdark is built like Swiss cheese for the surface world to sit atop. The interesting thing about the Underdark is that its environment is as varied as the surface world. There might be an empty, dry cavern inhospitable for survival, then a few miles away, a virtual fungi forest. There is even a large underground lake in the Underdark filled with vicious creatures. Food can be extremely difficult to find, which plays into the survival theme of this adventure. Also in the Underdark is the magical radiation called Fersris. This is a magic that is supposedly a remnant of the forces that shaped the Underdark in the beginning. It's a drow word, and the drow actually sought places with a strong Fersris to build their cities, utilizing its magic for their own purposes. It also aided in preventing others from scrying or teleporting into the drow cities. Fersris could also affect magic and spell casting in unpredictable ways, acting sometimes like wild magic. And some plants actually feed off of this radiation as their nutritional staple. Demons. Demons are the main part of this adventure, and I won't give too much about the adventure away, but if you're going to DM it, you need to know about the Demon Lords of the Abyss. I've done a video on the Demon Lords you can watch for more information, but in short, here they are. Baphomet, who is a minotaur-looking creature that uses mazes as his home in the Abyss. He believes civilization is a weakness and savagery is strength. Demogorgon, who is also known as the Prince of Demons, is a two-headed creature that is a combination of different forms. An ape-like torso with simian heads, webbed feet and tentacled arms, he is the embodiment of chaos, madness, and destruction. Fraz Ublu is the Prince of Deception and Illusions. He appears as a great gargoyle and often tricks his followers into thinking they're worshipping some forgotten deity or granter of wishes. Grazit is one of the more interesting demon lords. Legend says Grazit was an archdevil sent to the Abyss as part of the Blood War. He ended up conquering three layers of the Abyss, but became corrupted by the chaotic forces. He renounced his allegiance to the devils and became a demon lord ruling over his corner of the Abyss. He's a muscular humanoid with skin like polished obsidian. Grazit is the demon lord of pleasure and indulgence. Juiblix is next. He is the demon lord of slimes and oozes. He is a bubbling mass of black and green slime with red floating eyeballs within its form. 
He shares a layer of the abyss with Zagutmoy, who detests him, but is unable to remove him from their collective layer. Only the truly insane worship Juiblix. He's more of a force of destruction than a calculated thinking demon lord. Orcus is the demon prince of undeath. He takes pleasure in the suffering of others and wishes to build his undead army. Preferring the company of the undead, he has a unique artifact known as the Wand of Orcus that you can find in the Dungeon Master's Guide. He is a bestial creature of corruption with a diseased or decaying look. Yinugu, also known as the No Lord, when on the material plane, hyenas followed in his wake, and those that ate Yinugu's kills became corrupted and transformed into gnolls. Few outside of gnolls worship Yinugu. He takes pleasure in causing fear and death, destroying creatures and beloved things. And finally, Zagutmoy, the demon queen of fungi. Again, she shares a layer of the abyss with Juilix. She is all about decomposing creatures and things using mold, fungi, and spores. She'll use these spores to transform a creature's mind into worshiping her, becoming mindless servants. Her followers are often transformed where flesh and fungi become one. She hates Juiblix, but is unable to remove him from what she considers her lair. All the demon lords have two things in common. One, they want to cause destruction on the material plane, and two, they hate and will fight one another for supremacy. Next, I want to talk about some notable locations your PCs might visit within the Underdark. I'm not going to cover every location, as some of them were created for this adventure, but there are certain cities like Blingenstone, Gontelgrim, and Menzo Berenson that have appeared in previous modules or novels of the Forgotten Realms. Blingenstone is a Snurfiblin or Deep Gnome city in the Underdark. Founded in negative 690 DR, it was destroyed and abandoned in 1371 DR by the Drow, who slaughtered over 9,000 gnomes. But the Deep Gnomes returned around 1440 DR and began to rebuild the city. It is in this rebuilt state for the adventure Out of the Abyss, and it's roughly 45 miles west of the drow city Menzo Berenzen. Menzo Berenzen, the famed city of the drow, also known as the City of Spiders, it is the most well-known city to the surface world because it was home to famed hero Drist de Erden. Menzo Berenzen was founded by a priestess of Lolth, looking to leave the South Underdark and get away from other drow who worshipped Ganador. Lolth blessed this and in dreams sent them to a location north. Menzo Bera, the kinless, who founded Menzo Berenzen, took seven drow families with her. These houses fought one another, and ultimately Menzo Bera was killed, and House Banre rose as the first house of Menzo Berenzen. Menzo Berenzen has three academies. Arak Tinalith, which is the home and training for the priestesses of Lolth. Sorcery, which is the home to the wizards of Menzo Berenzen. And Mele Magathiri, where physical fighters are trained. The Banre family controls Arak Tinalith, with Quinthel Banre being the headmistress, and Gromf Banre being the archmage of sorcery. More details about both of these people are located in the module. Jarlaxel, who runs Brigand Dareth, is also a potential ally in the City of Spiders. If you want to learn more about him, click the link in the description or the top right corner. Gontelgrim is an ancient dwarven city and the capital of the Delzoon Dwarves. It was lost for many years but rediscovered by King Brunor Battlehammer. This is more of a meeting place for the party, but if you want to know more about the history of Gontelgrim, I've got a video detailing it. There are plenty of unique races that live in the Underdark. The party will most likely run into all of them. Drow, Duergar, Deep Gnomes are some of the more sentient creatures that you can negotiate with. However, there are Kuatoa, Fish People, Myconids, Mushroom People, Darrow, and Quaggiths. There's an extra video below in the description about the races of the Underdark, or read your friendly 5th edition monster manual. The final thing I want to talk about is this adventure makes reference to a Planescape adventure called the Great Modron March. You may run into some stray Modrons, which are mechanical creatures from Mechanus. No one knows why or when, but every number of years, the Great Modron March occurs. This is where thousands of Modrons march through the planes of existence around the Great Weald and return to Mechanus. In this adventure, Out of the Abyss, there are a few Modrons that were part of the Great March but got lost and are stuck in the Underdark. So your players start out of the abyss as prisoners. They are captured by the drow, and they're not the only ones there. There are a plethora of NPCs that um, your players can interact with that are also captured by the drow in this in this book, Out of the Abyss. Uh, so that is a little daunting at the beginning, especially as a dungeon master, for you to keep track of all of these different NPCs and have how they interact specifically. They all have their own motives. They all have their own locations they want to go to, but they're really an asset for your players. So I would encourage you leaving them in and actually make them something that your players can control. Hand them to your players and say, you're in charge of the orc, you're in charge of the dwarf, you're in charge of X, Y, and Z. So your players not only have their regular character, but they have some extra NPCs that they control as well. 
you are still doing, you as the dungeon master are still doing the interactions for them and they can ask them questions, but if they're in combat, you can have these players, uh, these NPCs help out your characters in combat. That is gonna help the survivability of your PCs a little later on because being level one in the Underdark in a sandbox adventure where you're rolling randomly to see what encounters are gonna happen, odds are somebody's going to die. If somebody does need to die early on, it can be that NPC. Um, if somebody needs to be sacrificed to the drow in order for the rest of the, the party to move on, that can be an NPC. Utilize them, no, don't just throw them away, but it can be a really good tool to keep that threat level high with your characters and really make them on edge and feel like they are not safe here in the Underdark, which they're not. Now, mechanics-wise, what do you need to know to really play this adventure? Well, I said earlier the theme of this adventure is survival, so there are things that you probably want to introduce into your game that maybe you haven't introduced in games past, like knowing that they have food and water. They have to look for food, they have to look for water, they need to use uh, survival roles to scout out and find that in the Underdark. As well as things like weapons and armor, they don't leave with, uh, you don't start the adventure with your full plate armor and your shield and your sword. You have like a makeshift dagger that's actually made out of a shard of metal and maybe some spider rope that you stole. Really keeping track of inventory can also, I think, enhance this game and its theme of survival and just the dangers of the Underdark. So tracking things like spell components. Um, if your players don't have a specific component for a spell or a wand or something like that, then there are certain spells that they might not be able to cast if they, even if they know those spells. So track those things and understand that, that it can have an impact on how your game is played and honestly make your players search out more. They might not necessarily want to run straight to the surface, they might want to run to other places to kind of gear up to then help them get to the surface. Also I want to point out that this is um, not that all D&D is easy or difficult, but I feel like this is an exceptionally difficult adventure and you could run it really, for lack of a better word, harsh. Not a lot of players are gonna like that their paladin doesn't start out with full plate mail. Not a lot of players are gonna like the fact that they don't have their weapons when they first start and they have to scavenge and find things. Uh, that dual wielding fighter who can only find the one short sword is gonna be a little sad that he took a lot of these feats and stuff and he's unable to utilize them. So when you start this adventure, I would be really upfront with your players from the get-go and say, this is the situation that you guys are gonna start in. So you won't have starting equipment, you won't have money, you won't have anything, you are prisoners. And that's okay, that's part of the fun of this adventure. Now, if they don't think that's fun, then that's okay. But I think being upfront with them rather than like them showing up with their character and then saying, surprise, you have none of your items is a little harsh. It's a little mean. So be upfront with them and let them know ahead of time that this is the situation that this module takes them in. It can be a lot of fun. It's just a different kind of fun than a hack and slash game or a dungeon delve where your characters are prepared. Also, Out of the Abyss is 100% a sandbox adventure. <laughs> There are choices that your characters will make early on, your players will make early on, that can affect later on outcomes of the game. So keep that in mind that as a DM, it's kind of improv heavy and it gets to the point where maybe you have to rewrite certain parts of the story in order for it to make sense for your players to continue on that path of the story. There are a lot of random encounters that are designed to level your players up. So when they go from point A to point B, they're gonna have X amount of random encounters hypothetically, and that's going to level them up to a certain uh, point. I would encourage you not to shy away from those random encounters and really roll them and play them out as they are um, so that your players, one, level up, and two, uh, get a sense of dread that is in the Underdark. Also, I was just thinking right now, playing a character in the Underdark, you might want to encourage your players to have some kind of dark vision or they're going to be uh, sad, just not being able to see everything. A major part of Out of the Abyss is the Demon Lords. And because there are Demon Lords within this adventure, there is a madness mechanic. And that's also really fun. When uh, but again, different. So I would encourage your players when they get a thing of madness, uh, say that, that maybe reward extra XP or inspiration or something if they role play their madness out because it, it's not necessarily fun to lose part of your, to lose control of part of your, of your character. But if you can encourage your players to embrace the madness that has come with them as part of the story, I think overall they'll have more fun and you'll have more fun as a dungeon master. I think the madness mechanic is really cool and I like that there is something that is so foreign and weird that just by looking at it can cause your players to go into fits of crazy madness. 
And most often, madness isn't permanent and can be reversed if you have a cleric in the party. So don't, don't let your players get down in the dumps if they get too much madness associated with their character. Like I said earlier, I really like this adventure. I think there's, there's just something about it that is dark and gritty and that appeals to me as a dungeon master. So I would love to run this adventure. I haven't yet, but it's on my list of potential ones to run. Uh, unfortunately, other games that I've ran, I've already used the drow as a villain, so I don't really wanna use the drow as a villain again. So that's one of the reasons I haven't run Out of the Abyss. But if you've ran it or are running it, please let me know in the comments below, what are your thoughts on the adventure? Did I miss anything that's really key and important that we can highlight uh, as a pinned comment? Please let me know. Special thanks to Dice Dungeons for sponsoring this video and a super thanks to my patrons on Patreon that keep these videos going. You guys are really supporting the content and I wanna say thank you again so, so much. Um, for a video on the drow, click here. And if you want a video on the Underdark, you can click over here. Um, also links in the doobly-doo to videos about Jarlaxle and Gontelgrim and other things that I think might be interesting to you. If you are running out of the abyss, uh, you can learn more lore about all of those subjects down below. Uh, thank you guys again so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.